Fact Check TV. May of 2010, 16-year-old Khalif Browder was walking home from a party in the Bronx when he was stopped by the police and arrested for robbery. With his family unable to make the $10,000 bail, he was hauled off to one of the toughest jails in the country, Rikers Island. He would then spend the next three years there locked up for a crime he never committed. In June of 2013, all the charges were dropped. So why did it take over three years for prosecutors to determine that they didn't have a case against Khalif? Well, Khalif and his attorney, Paul Prestia, are here right now demanding answers. They join us at HuffPost Live. Welcome both to you. Hello, Mark. Khalif, I want to start right with you. Uh, what happened that night? Well, on that night, I had came from a party on 3rd Avenue with some friends, and I was going home, and that's when I was stopped by police officers, and they, had, they was explaining to me that there was a guy in one of their police cars that was saying that I allegedly robbed them, and... They had searched me, and the guy actually said, at first he said, I robbed him, and I didn't have anything on me. And that's you when- You say nothing, you mean no weapon and none of his no property? No weapon, no money, anything he said that I allegedly robbed him for. So the guy actually changed up his story and said that I actually tried to rob him, but then another police officer came, and they said that, that um, I robbed him two weeks prior, and then they said, we're gonna take you to the precinct, and most likely we're gonna let you go home, and then I never went home. They took me to the precinct, and I was there. So you go to the precinct, you're photographed, you get your mugshot, you get fingerprinted. Yes. And they told you that you could post bail. Yes, that's correct. $10,000. Yes. And, of course... I, I couldn't make that. Hmm. My family couldn't pay it. So you went to Rikers Island, and did they attempt... What was the next step? Did, you, did they try to get you an attorney? Uh, public well, defender? What happens there? Well, my family tried to get me a public... Um, well, tried to get me a lawyer, but my family was doing, um, they was going through some hard times at the time, so they couldn't post bail or either get me a lawyer. So I was handed um, a legal aid, a legal um, attorney. So after that, I had to leave my, my case in his hands. It wasn't the best choice, but it was the only choice I had. Absolutely. Had you, did you have a record going into this? No. So you had, you had you been arrested before at all? No. So you hadn't been arrested, you had no convictions then, obviously, if you hadn't been arrested, there's no conviction. And you're in Rikers Island now, charged with, what were the formal charges against you? Robbery, robbery in the second degree. Robert, robbery in the second degree, and no explanation is given to you. What did your attorney tell you when he saw this case? Well, he actually told me, well, he just showed me the evidence that they supposedly had on me, which was the dude saying that I robbed him, his statement. And I told him I didn't do this. I don't know how I'm here. He said he's gonna work on the case, but after a while, I just kept hearing the same thing from the whole three years, and I just learned to cope with just just being in there. And that was that was rough. I already knew. I don't, after a while, I just gave up hope. Three years is a long time. I mean, did you find it odd? I mean, that you know, month after month is going by and there's no updates, there's no hearing, there's nothing. I mean, it wasn't that strange, even when you talk to other prisoners who were in there, I mean. Yes. It, it, was, it was weird from, from the first day I was in there. From the first day they put the um, handcuffs on me, it was weird for me. I mean, because I knew I didn't do it, and then I don't know this dude, and then I know that they're not, I felt like the police wasn't conducting their job correct. So I knew from the first day I was in there that, it, that everything was wrong, but it was, it was hard knowing that for the whole three years, which was very hard. And then it came to the fact, I mean, it came to the point when they offered me time served. And that was that, that's when it really got real, real stressful for me because being in there for about 33 bumps and you, you, you miss everything, everything about being home, the fresh air, your family, certain events, you want to be home. And then when they give you an offer to go home right then and there, it's like, I want to go home, but then you know you didn't do it, so you don't want to plead, take the plea and say that you do it is not right. So, so what happened is let, let me let me set this up for okay. our viewers, some who don't know the entire situation. After 33 months, right, uh, they come to Khalif and offer him a plea a deal where he would admit to committing the crime in exchange for a, a reduced sentence. And because he'd already served 33 months 
in Rikers Island, he would essentially have time served. In other words, he would go home having served his time for a crime that he would admit that he committed. As you're saying, that's a heck of a choice to make. Yes. You're, you're sitting there saying, I know I didn't do this, but I want to go home. And yes. you've already been sitting in prison for three years. And if you go take this to trial, yes. you were facing a lot more than the three years you'd already served. You of were course. facing up to what? Up to 15 years. Up to 15 years. So you had to choose between being in prison for up to 15 years and going home right then by admitting you did a crime you didn't do. That's correct. You're a better man than me, man. How, you, you made a decision that you were going to fight this. That's correct. How'd you come to that conclusion? Because I know deep down inside in my heart, I didn't do I didn't feel at least com comfortable do, um, saying that I did it. I, I wasn't going to say that I did a case that I didn't do. Why? For the simple fact that I felt like I was done wrong. I felt like something needed to be done about this. I felt like something needs to be said. If I just cop out and say that I did it, nothing's going to be done about it. I didn't do it. No justice is served. Nobody hears nothing at all. I, ha I felt like I had to fight. I had to fight. How much of a struggle was that for you, though? Because there was part of it was saying, I want to see my family. I want to he hear some, some music again. I want to feel the fresh air again. I want to see my friends again. I want to wear some different clothes again. I want to eat right. a good meal again. I want to, you I know. Mean, I mean, it was real stressful. I mean, I, there was times, I, there was nights when I couldn't go to sleep because all I thought about was when I go home, what would, what would be the first thing I would do? There was times when I had cried myself to sleep and it, it, was, it, it was hard, the whole thing, and, and, and being in there with the correction officers and them making my stay even harder, it, that, that, was, that was one of the main things that had me stressed because that, that, that court date that they had told me that if I say I did, I could go home, is, is the same day that I came back from court and I had gotten a, a little petty argument with a correction officer and he had starved me, so it's like... You said he starved you? Yes, I was what, starved. Explain that. There are a lot of people here who don't understand what happens in prison. Well, at the time, I was put in solitary confinement because I was jumped by the correction officers and they said that I had allegedly assaulted them first, so they had put me in solitary confinement. And in solitary confinement, they control your food and how much food you get. And when it's time for feeding, they give you your food. So if you if you if you say anything that could tick them off in any type of way, some of them, which is a lot of them, what they do is they starve you. They they won't feed you, and it's already hard in there because if you get the three trays that you get every day, you're still hungry because I guess that's part of the punishment. So if they starve you one tray, that 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 could really make an impact on you. And how much were you starved? I, I was starved a lot. I can't even I can't even count. But the worst the worst the worst time I was starved is when they starved me for four times in a row. They starved me breakfast, lunch, dinner, and breakfast again. Wow. And finally, it took it took because I was trying to tell the captains and the superiors, the rest of the superiors, about what, was, what they was doing, but nobody wanted to listen to me and nobody wanted to help me. And it, it finally, I finally came across the captain that that heard me out and and fixed the problem, make sure I was a I, I was fed. And even the shower, they was denying me a shower in there too. So in the midst of all of that, being starved, being prepared for, or, or, or exper exposed to all sorts of violence, you're faced with the choice of you can leave here right now, yes, or you can f continue to fight this thing. And you made the decision to continue to fight it. How scared were you that the outcome wouldn't be good? I was petrified. I was petrified. I, I, I was, because I already knew if I, if I get up to 15, the jail I was in is bad already as it is. The whole thing is bad. So I already knew that if jail is bad, just imagine if they send me to one of them upstate prisons. I never even been there. So it, it was very scary. I mean. How scared were you in general population on a day to day? Petrified all day. I was scared all day because I didn't know where it would come from. I don't know any, where any harm would come. I seen a lot of things being done to people in there and I, I didn't know if I was gonna be next for it. I seen people getting jumped. I seen people getting cut and, and hit with weapons and all, chairs, all type of stuff. So it, it's scary. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't friends with a lot of people in there. So when you don't got friends, it's really scary because you don't know what anybody would do to you. And they know you don't got nobody to back you up. So. Yeah. Now, now this is a delicate question. And, and if you don't want to talk about this at this point, I totally understand. But. Um, there were points where you attempted suicide. Is yes. That, is that wh how many times did that happen, and, and what were the circumstances around it? I would say I committed suicide about five to six, five or six times. Okay, you attempted suicide five to six times. Yes. While all, in, while, all while still in prison. Yes. Wow. And I, I, I try, I tried to resort to 
telling the correction officers that I wanted to um, see a psychiatrist or a counselor or something. I was telling them I need mental health because I wasn't feeling right. All, all the stress from my case, everything was just getting to me and I just I just couldn't take it. I just needed somebody to talk to. I needed to just let, let, let I just needed to be, I just needed to talk and be stress free. But the correction officers, they didn't want to hear me out. Nobody wanted to listen. So when I tried to kill myself at, at one point, which was in 2010, 2012 March, at one point I tried to kill myself. How, how, what did you do? I had, I had took, I had ripped my sheets on my, um, I had ripped my bed sheets and made a noose out of it, and I had hung it to something that's on the ceiling, a light fixture, and I was about to jump, and the correction officers cracked. They opened my cell, and when I jumped. They grabbed me. They threw. They they cut me down. They threw me on the um, bed. They had um, gave me a lot of punches. They stomped me on the bed. They took my sheets, my books, my covers, and they stomped me for about two, three trays straight. So they punished and, you for this. Yes. They attacked you and punished you for this. Yes. Wow. And then after that, you know, because in a lot of places the expectation would be that you'd be put on some sort of suicide watch. You'd be put into um, a mental facility that you'd be at least given some sort of treatment yes they put you right back into the cell yes only only one time that there was a, a a suicide incident where they gave me the proper treatment that i was that i'm supposed to get only one time and that was the last time i had tried to kill myself in there and that was two that was that was about March. his story was supposed to be one of redemption khalif browder reclaiming his life after three years on rikers island he was never convicted of a crime. He went in at just 16 years old. They ruined a family. They took my brother. Tonight, a prayer vigil outside the Manhattan detention complex. We pray sorrow for the loss of Khalif. The 22-year-old hung himself in his parents' home last weekend, still haunted by the horrors of life on Rikers Island. At this evening's vigil, his brother was filled with mixed emotions, sorrow for the loss of a best friend, anger at the system that failed him. He was being jumped by inmates. This is what's supposed to be happening in jail. This is not a, it's not a fight for, friend for yourself while you're in jail. This isn't fight to, uh, fight to death. These are surveillance videos that show actual beings of Khalif Browder inside the jailhouse. They were uncovered as part of an expose in The New Yorker about the dark side of Rikers Island. When he came home, he had he had a hard time transitioning from being confined for 300 something days to then coming home to freedom. Nobody can adjust to that. Also this week, a teenager, 18 year old Keenan Davis committed suicide in his cell hours before he was supposed to see a prison psychiatrist. And the same day, the FBI arrested a former Rikers officer, Brian Call, and current guard, Byron Taylor. They're accused of killing a former inmate, 52-year-old Ronald Spears, like this. Cole then allegedly grabbed Mr. Spears' head, told him to, quote, remember, I am the one who did this to you, close quote, and then dropped Mr. Spears' head to the ground. Mr. Spear died there on the jail floor minutes later. Stanley Richards only found peace after serving several years on Rikers by starting a nonprofit. It's called the Fortune Society. They help inmates adjust to life beyond bars. Whether you paid your price for your crime or whether you was found innocent, you try to reclaim your life, it's very tough. Emotionally, it's very tough. His only wish today is they could do more to prevent even more stories like Khalif Browder's. Good morning, everyone. Sitting here with me is Mrs. Vanita Browder to my left, and also her civil rights lawyer, Paul Prestia. Thank you so much for both being here. You. You've all seen the video. No doubt you're familiar with Khalif's case. And Khalif's case has become such an egregious example of juvenile injustice, and it's been stirring our collective consciousness and our conscience. But before Khalif was a powerful rallying cry, he was a well-adjusted, happy, young man. Can you tell us a little bit about what he was like before jail, Vanita? Yes, Khalif was just a normal kid, you know. Um, he has five other brothers and a sister and playing pranks, you know, um, video games, Yu-Gi-Oh and Dragon Ball, just normal stuff. And yet he spent three years on Rikers Island with no trial, two years in solitary confinement. I'm just gonna let that sink in for a second, without a trial. 
Yes. These are devastating numbers, and the conditions under which he was held were even worse. Throughout the time, he was given opportunities to plead guilty and get time served and get out, but he refused. What was it about his personality that made him refuse to plead guilty? He didn't do it, and he stood his ground, and he wanted a trial to prove his innocence. He was a determined person, and if he felt he was right, he was going to fight for it. And he certainly did for three years. Paul, get, tell us some of the, I mean, again, these are stark numbers. Three years at Rikers, and yet the conditions are, under which he was held were barbaric. That's an understatement, especially for what you would consider uh, the city of New York, a progressive city like ours. Uh, and, and it's been well documented, the uh, pattern and practice of abuses that have gone on in solitary in solitary confinement at Rikers Island. Uh, if Khalif was here to articulate what he had gone through by himself, Juju, uh, I'm pretty certain that everyone in the room uh, would be in tears. Uh, that's how powerful and how sad his ordeal was. We're talking about beat he was on a gang ward. He was not a member of a gang, so he right. was uh, inflicting beatings. Um, I have some video. Well, it's, it's wor even worse than that, Juju. It's the starvation by the guards. It's the treatment of the, by the guards uh, that amounted to torture. I mean, they tortured him. They starved him. They didn't take him outside. They didn't take him to the shower. And I can go on and on and on. Right. And I think, uh, right. Just to bring home the point, we right. have some video, surveillance mm -hmm. video of, of an incident that actually occurred, one of many, sadly, um, to Khalif. Vanita, what was those three, like, those three years like for you? You would go to court. He often wouldn't be there. You knew what was going on. What was that like for you as a mom? It was hard. You know, I mean, when you go there for a court, each go court date, I was praying, okay, today is going to be the day that they say, okay, there's no case. He's going to go home. But it didn't, didn't turn out that way. And sometime I'm sitting in court and he's not there. And normally the, they'll have him come, you know, appear before lunchtime. So it was lunchtime and no Khalif. So I said, well, what happened? Oh, they didn't bring him. How could you not bring a person for their own court? To, and it happened more than twice. Paul, there were 30 delays in his right. trial, on his way to trial. This is almost like a waiting game that prosecutors play. Uh, it's certainly a game. But, in my, but my only conclusion that it was more than a game here and that it was a reckless disregard by this district attorney's office to prosecute Khalif. Uh, and, I, and I can only conclude that they presumed him guilty. And this doesn't just happen in Khalif's case. This happens in every borough, in every county in this city, where the prosecutors just assume that this young man's in jail, he's probably guilty, and, and they're he's going to take the plea. Guilty right. because they want their statistics to right. be positive in and, terms of. Right. And the incredible thing about this case is that this wasn't a complex case. Uh, it was a very simple case, something that any first-year prosecutor, prosecutor could have at least brought to court and tried before a judge or jury. And let's talk about a lack of services. When he was let go, he was given a Metro card in the middle of the night, no right. mental health services. What was that like for him, Benita? He came home, but it was Khalif, but it wasn't Khalif. He just was a different person. He was more sad, like in a dark place. He wasn't the same. The smiles disappeared. Once in a while, you'll see a little fragment of a smile. He had classic PTSD. I mean, you described yes. um, incidents where he would pace his room. He would pace the room, the driveway. He used to walk the four corners every day. And I said, Khalif, what's the matter? He said, Ma, that's all I was allowed to do, was walk the four corners of the room. And it took months. I mean, months for him to stop that. So and, for and two Juju, years, yeah. he, sorry, go, go ahead. No, what I was just going to mention was that he was released with a Metro card, and they knew at Rikers Island. He had a history of suicide attempts. At that, Rikers. Right. So the fact that they sent him home without any sort of medical or follow-up care is, is, is beyond belief. So and, the t and in Rikers Island, when he was sent when he did get care for, a suicide, for those suicide attempts, on the occasions that the officers actually brought him there, sometimes they sent him back into solitary 
So he had vicious beatings at the hands of gangs. He had solitary confinement for all this time. He clearly had flashbacks every day, Benita, that you described, and yet he still fought through to get his GED and to keep trying to better himself. He was determined. He, he, he hated Rikers, and he didn't want to do anything to ever go back. He wanted to turn his life, you know, and just be, as, as you say, a productive citizen or whatever. And he tried. I mean, he, he got his GED. He took it the first time and passed. Then he enrolled into BCC, Bronx Community College. I mean, he ended his spring semester with a 3.5. Now, you took away three years of my son's life. Imagine what he could have accomplished if he was able to be out here getting an education like he was supposed to. He could have went far. And yet, the, the depression stayed. Tell me, Paul, you have two lawsuits going. One is right. obviously the wrongful arrest, wrongful imprisonment, but there's also a wrongful death suit. Tell us about those. All right. Uh, shortly after Cleve's death, we filed a notice of claim with the city of New York. His parents filed it. We filed it on his parents' behalf, uh, alleging, and I actually got the idea from Vanita. And we had a conversation, I think, I don't know if it was the day that Khalif passed away, and I was at the house, or it was at the funeral, and she said, you know, it's, it wasn't just one person that killed Khalif. It was a whole system. And this suit is sort of different than uh, your, your usual wrongful death suit, where for example, the Eric Gardner case, where the police officer puts, puts a chokehold on him and he dies, and he wrongfully causes death. We're, what we're alleging here is that that three-year experience, that three-year ordeal, especially those two years of solitary confinement as a teenager, that torture, and incidents like this that you just saw, that corrections officer, Vaughn Greenwich, who I should just mention, is still employed by the corrections department, as far as I know, has not been disciplined, and has not been arrested, that was a crime he committed. But if the commissioner, if Commissioner Ponte's here, perhaps he can elaborate on that. In any event, I'm sorry to digress. Benita, and, and, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the, and with the wrongful death, uh, we're not only alleging that it was the city of New York and its agencies that caused his death and that time in solitary, but even afterward, because he didn't get that proper psychiatric care in solitary, they released him, and he had three more setbacks where he, was, where he had attempted suicide and was hospitalized in psychiatric wards. And even despite that, he was released from those institutions with sporadic, minimal psych psychiatric care. So we could only conclude that had, not, had Khalif not been arrested, he'd be alive today. And I think, I'm sure you're going to touch on this, President Obama abolished solitary for juveniles. He made that... Uh, executive order earlier in the week. And I think what he said was, uh, it's remarkable that he mentioned Khalif's name, of course, but he even suggested that this solitary, that time in solitary confinement, could lead to suicide. Absolutely. Tell me, Vanita, he had ups, he had downs, he was struggling. Tell us about, you know, what led up to the, that horrible day. He, he would go into these dark places. And when I say dark places, I mean, he, he could be happy, like watching TV. Then all of a sudden you see him and he's like this totally different person. And you have to look and say, oh my God, what, what happened? But you leave him alone because if you keep after him, then he shuts down. You know, he became a very private person and you can't agitate him because he won't let you in anymore. And the happy-go-lucky was gone. And, and it was gone. And it, he would be like that. Then next thing you know, he would be happy again. But it was too many memories of what he went through. And no matter how I tried, I just couldn't get through. I'm sorry. You, never really, you never really knew. You, you never really you knew. Yourself. You can't blame yourself. Mm -hmm. And I know you were the one who actually found him. Yes, I was home uh, alone with him, and he, we had a little discussion earlier, and I was at a loss as to what to do. I didn't know what to do, how to really, you know, help him, because he, he became very paranoid. 
very paranoid. Worried about getting beaten or attacked. Yes, and I tried talking to him, so he went upstairs, and I was just laying on my bed, and he came in, he said, Ma, you, that was his thing. Ma, you all right? I said, yeah, I'm okay. He went back upstairs, and I hear all this moving, so I figured, you know, he was in his brother's room, he's situating the room so he could get comfortable and watch TV. Then I hear him pacing from one room to the other, but when Khalif is upset, he paces. So I didn't pay attention. Then all of a sudden, I hear this loud noise, and I'm like, oh my goodness, the child and threw his brother's TV out the window. But I said, he can't because there's bars. So I said, wait a minute, I go upstairs, I went in his brother's room, nothing. Then I went in the other room, and he had kicked out the air conditioner covers, and I saw this gold rope thing and I ran downstairs and when I opened the backyard door his foot one of his feet was on the the bar of the gate and I said Khalid stop playing this is not a joke it's not funny I said Khalid and then I got afraid to open the door all the way in case it was my fault that the, he you know he snapped but when I pe when I looked up his head was just hanging back he was gone and that loud noise was his body banging up against the house. He had been fighting for five years to proclaim his innocence. I can't tell you how sorry we all are for your loss, Vanita. Um, I know we had mentioned it, Mayor de Blasio has spoken up and invoked Khalif's name. President Obama wrote about it in the Washington Post in banning solitary confinement for juveniles. Even Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy has talked about Khalif's case, and yet to this day, you feel you've not heard no. an apology. You know, when I heard Obama, when I, um, that he mentioned Khalif, I was like, oh goodness, finally. But he, the President of the United States acknowledged it. Mayor de Blasio and the, and the judge, but the city, the city won't acknowledge it. Rikers, NYPD, the judicial system, all three of them had a part in my son's death, and nobody has come forward to take the blame. And Juju, the, the dichotomy there is that the city of New York has made all these reforms in light of Khalif's death. He was the impetus of those reforms. And even Mayor de Blasio, who has, um, was the, who started some of these reforms himself in light of Khalif's death, came out when Khalif passed away and he gave his condolences, which was very nice of him. And then he, but then he conveniently changed his subject to mental health, saying we needed more mental health workers. When that wasn't the issue, he should have stood up and been a leader and reprimanded the officers and agencies and individuals involved. And still to, these, and still to this day, and still to this day, no one has come forward and apologize and acknowledge that this happened. Vanina, it hurts my heart to tell you that we're out of time, but I just want you to get one last answer in, which is what is justice for you and for Khalif? For me, justice for me and Khalif is um, letting them admit that they're the reason my son is dead. If he would have never been literally snatched off the street on, on a, a flimsy case that never happened, he will be here now. And so I want them to admit it. But Juju, anything at this point is bittersweet because he's not here. To say and the very least. Paul, thank you so much. Vanita, thank you for coming and sharing. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.